The Carboniferous period is perhaps best known for being the time of giant creepy crawlies, basically modern South America on steroids. The skies teemed with insects the size of seagulls, while millipedes longer than a man is tall scuttled over the land. But in the swampy waters of the Carboniferous, there dwelled yet another titan of the arthropod world, one that is far less well known than the supersized griffin flies and millipedes, but could very well have dwarfed them all. Eurypterids or sea scorpions, which were not scorpions and did not all live in the sea, are a group that I dare say most ancient arthropod aficionados ought to be familiar with. A recent video of mine covered Eucalopterus renaniae, one of the biggest and most formidable of all the Eurypterids. And this time around we'll be looking at another giant Eurypterid, but one that could not have been more different to Eucalopterus. The Eurypterids are broadly divided into two suborders, the Eurypterina and the Styloneurina. The former is the group that most known species belong to, and is characterised by the modification of the rearmost pair of limbs into flattened swimming paddles. Meanwhile, in the lesser known Styloneurina, there is no such specialisation with the hind limbs being equivalent in structure and function to the rest of the legs, indicating that, unlike the Eurypterina, styloneurines were built more for walking than swimming. By the Carboniferous, the Eurypterines, having long passed their glory days in the preceding Devonian period, were hanging on by a mere thread. But the styloneurines remained diverse and at least one attained sizes rivalling the very biggest of the Eurypterines. In 1831, fossils of a large and rather unusual arthropod that had been unearthed in Scotland were described. These remains comprised an enormous head and several tergites, which are the armour plates that protect the upper surface of an arthropod's body. Though these remains were described, it was another five years before the animal they belonged to was given a name. The original description established that these fossils represented a Eurypterid. In other time, just one genus, Eurypterus, had been hitherto known, the full extent of the group's diversity having yet to come to light. As such, this new species was placed in the genus Eurypterus, and dubbed Eurypterus schooleri after naturalist John Schooler, who first described its remains. While known Eurypterid species were thin on the ground at the time of its discovery, it wasn't long before more remains were unearthed, and the group's sheer variety became ever more apparent with each discovery. Among them was a species whose remains were initially misinterpreted to have belonged to a horseshoe crab, but when significant distinctions were recognised, it was reclassified as a Eurypterid, and named Campylocephalus oculatus. Comparisons with Eurypterus schooleri revealed strong similarities in overall form, thus providing grounds for the latter's reclassification as a member of the genus Campylocephalus. But the taxonomic identity crisis befalling this strange Eurypterid was far from being resolved. Further studies found notable differences in morphology between it and Campylocephalus oculatus. Namely, its eyes were located roughly in the centre of the carapace, while those of Campylocephalus were situated considerably further back. Additionally, the carapace of Campylocephalus was comparatively narrow, with its widest point being roughly around the middle. Meanwhile, the carapace of the giant species described by Schooler was very broad, and its widest point was closer to the rear. This suite of differences warranted yet another genus transfer, this time to Hibbertopterus, which had been erected to honour geologist Samuel Hibbert, who coined the animal's initial species name. And to this day, the bizarre Eurypterid is known as Hibbertopterus schooleri. Since then, additional Hibbertopterus fossils have been uncovered, including some that were distinctive enough to be regarded as new species within the genus, and it seems that these giant arthropods ranged well beyond Carboniferous Scotland, having now been found not only elsewhere in Europe, but the United States and even South Africa, 
and not just in Carboniferous sediments either, for some older specimens hail from the Devonian. In spite of these new names on the catalogue, Hippotopterus schooleri remains the largest member of its genus known from relatively complete remains. The carapace of one specimen measured 65 centimetres wide. So given the species' compact body proportions, the complete animal would have likely measured less than 2 metres long, substantially shorter than other giant arthropods like Arthropleura armata and several pterygotid species, namely Ecolopterus renaniae. However, in stark contrast to the elongate, streamlined pterygotids, Hippotopterus was quite the chunky fucker, suggesting that even if it didn't quite clear the competition in the length department, it may have been equally massive, if not more so. And its size could have further exceeded the estimates we can garner from its known bodily remains. Trackways found in South Africa that have been ascribed to a Hippotopterus species, or at the very least something similar, indicate an animal measuring around two and a half metres long, which would not only rival other giant arthropods in length, but drastically surpass them in weight making Hippotopterus, or perhaps a close relative, very likely the biggest arthropod of all time by quite a considerable margin. But there's more to Hippotopterus than just its size, and the identity crisis it suffered in the years following its discovery. Another interesting point of discussion revolves around this creature's possible ecology. A quick glance at the animal makes it very clear that it wasn't suited for the active apex predator niche occupied by other giant Eurypterids like Ecolopterus. So how else could it have lived? An important aspect of any animal's ecology is its diet, and it goes without saying that if you want to draw meaningful conclusions about what an animal fed on or how it may have hunted, examining the business end is an ideal place to start. The chelicerae, or mouthparts, were small and weakly developed to the point that they would have been obscured from sight when viewing the animal from above. But the chelicerae aren't the only body parts that could have aided in feeding. The next three pairs of appendages behind the chelicerae also exhibit signs of being specialised for foraging purposes, and they can perhaps shed more light on the animal's diet than the chelicerae themselves. On each of these appendages, the segments nearer the tip are densely covered with sense organs, and adorned with multiple long, narrow blades, telltale signs that the animal used these limbs for foraging. Since their poor grasping capability, in conjunction with the diminutive nature of the chelicerae, effectively discount the possibility of Hippotopterus hunting relatively large animals, it's believed that Hippotopterus was most likely a sweep feeder, using its spiked limbs to rake through sediment for small, benthic prey items like worms and mollusks. Hippotopterus had something of an unusual gait for a chelicerate. Like all members of the clade, it possessed six pairs of prosomal appendages, but as aforementioned, the first four were all specialised for feeding, though the fourth pair could have also been used to walk. The remaining two pairs were both walking legs, Meaning that, unlike many familiar chelicerates like spiders and scorpions, Hippotopterus would have used six legs to locomote instead of eight. Though Hippotopterus was by and large an aquatic animal, all fossils having been found in freshwater sediments, there is evidence that this armoured swamp monster could have been capable of brief forays onto land as well. A six metre long trackway found in Scotland that matches the gait of a large Hippotopterus exhibits telltale signs that the animal that created it was moving outside of water, namely a continuous deep groove running along the centre that corresponds with the motions of a hefty telson being dragged laboriously over the sediment. Quite contrary to what one would expect if the animal was underwater and thus unburdened by gravity. Now let's return to a couple matters we've discussed prior. One, that Hippotopterus was very big and potentially even bigger, and the other being the taxonomic confusion that has surrounded this animal pretty much since its discovery. And this last portion of the video covers a befuddling aspect of this chunky chelicerate, 
that is an amalgam of both of the above topics. In the decades following its initial exposure to the public eye, many more fossils, not only of Hippotopterus species, but an assortment of very similar Eurypterids, have been unearthed. Among them, two genera called Cytotenus and Dunsopterus. But unlike Hippotopterus schooleri, which is known from well-preserved fossils that comprise significant portions of the animal's body, Cytotenus and Dunsopterus are both known only from rather fragmentary remains, though even the relatively scant fossil record of these two genera shows evidence that they were more specialised than Hippotopterus, the limbs of Cytotenus in particular being armed not with blades as in Hippotopterus, but fine, comb-like structures each bearing rows of densely packed filaments that would have been able to entrap even very small prey items something beyond the apparent capabilities of Hippotopterus schooleri. The feeding anatomy of Cytotenus represents quite possibly the most complete specialisation towards sweet feeding in any known Eurypterid, and a shining example of just how ecologically diverse these arthropods were. But there may be more to Cytotenus than it meets the eye, especially in terms of its relationship with Hippotopterus. It has in fact been proposed that Cytotinus alongside Dunsopterus constitute not distinct genera, but older individuals of Hippotopterus, and a few lines of reasoning were presented to support this conclusion. Cytotinus and Dunsopterus both co-occur with Hippotopterus, and all known fossils of these two genera comprise fragmentary remains of what were almost certainly very large Eurypterids. Meanwhile, smaller Hippotopterus specimens tend to be much more complete. This difference in preservation can be quite well accounted for by the hypothesis that Cytotenus and Dunsopterus represent older life stages of Hippotopterus. Younger, smaller individuals would still be growing, and as all arthropods grow, they molt periodically, leaving their old, empty exoskeleton behind. If the fossils attributed to Hippotopterus do indeed come from juveniles, then it is likely that many may represent molted exoskeletons instead of actual corpses. And an empty shell is, of course, not the most appetising target for scavengers, hence their often more complete preservation. Meanwhile, fossils of Cytotenus and Dunsopterus belonging to what are presumably large, adult individuals past their growth spurt, are more likely to have been the dead bodies of the animals themselves, and thus more susceptible to scavenging, leading to their fragmented state of preservation. Another argument that has been put forward in favour of the above hypothesis regards the ineffectiveness of the typical Hippotopterus feeding apparatus past a certain size. The space between the blades on Hippotopterus limbs would broaden as the animal's overall size increases, and beyond a certain point, the distance between neighbouring blades would become too wide for the Eurypterid to be able to effectively rake small animals from within the sediment. Thus, it's possible that as the animal attained larger sizes, its anatomy may have changed to accommodate this shifting towards a more specialised feeding apparatus like the combs possessed by Cytotinus. And such a drastic transformation in limb anatomy later in life is by no means unheard of in Eurypterids. Drepanopterus pentalandicus, an early relative of Hippotopterus, displays evidence of significant alteration of the armature of its limbs as the animal reached adulthood. So, essentially, Eurypterids are nature's precursors to motivational speakers harping on about how it's never too late to change. If Cytotenus and Dunsopterus are indeed older individuals of Hippotopterus, then that would of course warrant the reclassification of both of these genera as part of Hippotopterus. However, it seems that clear consensus regarding the classification of these three genera has yet to be reached. A more recent publication does regard Dunsopterus and Hippotopterus as one and the same, but argues that Cytotinus should still be considered a separate genus. Hope you all appreciated this opportunity to learn about the arthropod world's ultimate heavyweight. 
If you'd like to learn about other giant prehistoric arthropods, then take a look at this video about the similarly enormous Eucalopterus. Thanks for watching, and I will see you again next time. Been doing YouTube for this long, and I still don't know how to do an outro. I'm done.